Silicon Valley, California. Known worldwide as the center of high-tech innovation, home to dozens of global iconic brand names. In Silicon Valley, technology, brain power, and venture capital merge to create disruptive technology-based revolutions, including the microchip, the personal computer, the internet, and wireless communications. The spark that ignited Silicon Valley's explosive growth can be traced back to a dispute that occurred in this building at 391 San Antonio Road, Mountain View. Eight young scientists quit their jobs at a transistor laboratory run by William Shockley. In Silicon Valley lore, they became known as the Traitorous Eight. The New York Times called it one of the top 10 days that changed history. The date, September 18. 1957. The eight young men who quit their job that day were hand-picked by William Shockley. In the electronics world of the 1950s, William Shockley was a giant. Shockley managed the team that included John Bardeen and Walter Bratton, the Bell Lab scientist who discovered the transistor in 1948. With funding from Arnold Beckman, a wealthy scientist turned businessman, Shockley established the Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory in 1955. Shockley went against Beckman's recommendation to set up in Southern California, near Beckman's own company, and established the lab near his hometown of Palo Alto. The people at Bell Labs uh, did not want to go back and work underneath him in a new company out on the West Coast, so Shockley then uh, was faced with having to recruit people from all over the country, and he did a wonderful job. Robert Noyce, who would later go on to found Intel, remembers the day he answered the phone and Shockley was on the line. It was like getting a call from God, he said. I had given a couple of papers. Bill Shockley had heard of them, or had been in the audience, and invited me to come out and join his organization out in Palo Alto. Dr. William Shockley thought he needed a chemist in a new operation he was setting up, and gave me a call one evening to see if I would be interested in talking to him about that possibility. This was November of 55. He'd hired then two people. I was the third one he was considering hiring. He said, uh, uh, you have passed our test with flying colors, and I hope you will wish to join my project at a starting salary of $675 a month. And I was told by the uh, Bell Labs people, I said, you know, you, you don't know what you're getting into working with Shockley. But uh, I thought, well, California is where I want to live, and, uh, and uh, Whatever happens, it's going to be an interesting time. Typically, people could work for Shockley for about a year. They were really intelligent, top-notch uh, people who could be running their own company, like most of these people were. Uh, the, the, the bloom was off the rose after about a year. Every Monday morning, we have a technical meeting in his office, all jammed together. And it, at the end of the meeting, and each one is assigned a certain job to do. And, by noon, he said, how's it coming along? <laughs> so people getting sort of, some of the people just couldn't, couldn't take it. it just, he's too anxious to, to get the result. Although the young scientists had concerns about the overbearing management style of their new boss, all sins were forgiven when Shockley, along with Bratton and Bardeen, were named recipients of the Nobel Prize for their work on the transistor. That was a big day. Uh, the news came through you know, by the time we got to work in the morning, so we just went and spent the day celebrating. It started to get dicey 
just after he got the Nobel Prize. We had a big celebration, and and shortly thereafter, he began to tr to travel around the world rather extensively. And he would come back with uh, new ideas and new projects, and we never really got to finish the ones that we started with. And this got to be somewhat frustrating. The company had been chartered initially to make transistors, to make silicon transistors using the technology of diffusion, which promised very high speed, uh, very rugged transistors that the military were willing to pay $100 for. And he lost that vision because uh, he, he really wanted to make what was called the Shockley diode, a four-layer PN-PN diode. But they were incredibly difficult to manufacture. A four-layer semiconductor device was almost impossible given the technology of the time. And Noyce and Moore and Last tried to tell him this, but Shockley wouldn't hear of it. I knew trouble was brewing because uh, Shockley was uh, in the habit of picking on a couple of the physics guys almost uh, frequently. We had an incident in the laboratory where actually uh, a little uh, pinpoint was left in one of the doors and uh, a lady cut her hand on it a bit. And Shockley decided that was malicious and started trying to track down who had put this point there in order to hurt this lady. He felt that this, you know, this was sabotage and somebody was out to get him and he started a whole program of bringing in the, you know, detectives with lie detectors and that, that was really oh, off the wall. We didn't didn't take too kindly to that kind of thing at all. Everything began to come to a head in uh, May of 1957 when Arnold Beckman, the head of Beckman Industries, came up for a meeting. And in fact, uh, Shockley Semiconductor had been running in the red for a oh, year and a half at that point. Beckman came up to discuss what to do, principally how to get control of these uh, R&D costs. And right in the middle of that meeting, with all of his senior staff there, Shockley jumped up and shout it out, if you don't like the way I'm running things, I can take this group and get funding anywhere else. And then stormed out of the room. We use that as a, a reason to actually call Beckman and say, hey, that's not true. If Shockley tried to move here, uh, he'd have to go almost by himself. Beckman came up from Southern California and a group of us met with him to see what steps could be taken uh, to improve the management situation at Shockley. Initially, Arnold Beckman was um, sympathetic to the group of dissatisfied researchers at Shockley Semiconductor when he met with them. I think what he was probably seeing in the financial ledger was adding um, substance to what the young researchers were talking about. He was spending a lot of money and um, probably was independently concerned about what was coming out of the organization. He, he was caught up uh, between supporting the group or supporting a Nobel Prize winner, and he originally said he would support us. And I think he went back to Bell Labs and talked to the people and said, you know, Shockley's more important than the group. And he, I think, later on realized that he had made the wrong decision. Beckman's attitude toward us changed, and he essentially said, hey, Shockley's the boss, you guys like it, or whatever. At that time, we felt we had burned our bridges so badly that there was no way we could stick around working for Shockley after having gone around him to try to straighten out this problem. In the end, he backed down and decided he wasn't going uh, to remove Shockley from his, his role at the laboratory. And that sort of left us, uh, you know, hanging in midair. The situation became untenable, and we decided that uh, we were going to find other means of pursuing our careers in this industry. Arnold Beckman was an independent-minded man. He may have just in the end made his decision to uh, that he would trust in the, the potentials of this proven researcher, Nobel laureate, rather than uh, a collection of much younger men. We had all sort of uh, moved out to Silicon Valley. We loved it out there. We didn't want to move back to, well, I'd come from Philadelphia, so forth. We wanted to see if there wasn't some way to stay in the San Francisco area. 
Noyce was the sort of natural leader in the laboratory for a number of reasons, both his prior experience as somebody who had actually um, come up with new transistors uh, and been involved in manufacturing them at Philco, in addition to his personality, very outgoing, very charming, um, very competitive personality. So um, already at Shockley Semiconductor, among the young researchers, uh, Robert Noyce was a leader. Gene Kleiner's father had had some relationship with some Wall Street firm with, with some business he was running. And so Gene just wrote a letter to these people and we decided at that time to start our own company, which came as a really exciting, unknown thing for us to do. Sherman Fairchild, a New York industrialist, was intrigued by the potential of silicon transistors. He agreed to support the group with an investment of $1.3 million to start a new semiconductor company. Actually, Noyce didn't agree to come along until the last minute. He felt he had an obligation to stay as the technical advisor. He decided that wasn't going to work if we, if we bail out on mass because he didn't have anybody he knew that he could work with. And we persuaded Bob Noyce to join the group uh, finally after we had got things very well set up. So the eight of us went off and started Fairchild. We signed an agreement with that famous dollar bill that you saw was evidence of that. And um, I guess the rest is history. Shockley noted the fateful day in a brief diary entry on September 18th. The Traders 8, as they call it, uh, was a very sensitive subject, of course, because eight key scientists are leaving uh, suddenly, and he had worked very hard to find all these people, and he was very shocked, disappointed, and saddened by the fact they all decided to leave at the same time. Less than a month after setting up their new company, the Fairchild Eight received more good news. <laughs> Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. Sputnik signaled the start of the space race and ultimately led to significant U.S. government contracts for silicon transistors. We were just at the right time for making a product that the world needed and we had the right technology and what technology we didn't have, we developed. William Shockley's four-layer diode was never a commercial success, and Arnold Beckman sold the company in 1963. Some of the traitorous eight went on to bigger and better things. Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore founded Intel in 1968, now the world's biggest chip maker. In 1972, Eugene Kleiner founded a venture capital firm that seeded such companies as Amazon.com, Google, and Sun Microsystems. Today, a sign and a small plaque in the sidewalk are the only reminders of the role that Shockley Labs played in seeding Silicon Valley. Had Shockley located in Fullerton, next to the Beckman Instruments or Newport Beach where Arnold Beckman had an electronic components manufacturing operation going. Then perhaps Southern California would have had an even larger part to have played an even larger part in the early semiconductor industry. Gordon and I have speculated and given some talks on that, what would have happened if the group of us hadn't started Fairchild how fast would have things have moved. And this is a universal thing. There's a lot of people working on a lot of stuff. It would have happened. I'm not positive it would have happened in the Silicon Valley. <laughs>